so this is where we'll have our uh, our intro music that we'll we're gonna we'll probably record that for next week yeah one day maybe yeah we'll probably we'll have that next week for sure yeah. uh what's up everyone welcome to episode two of dipped in tone i'm rhett i'm zach and uh thank you for joining us huge response yeah. on the first episode man yeah, I was kind of uh, I was kind of surprised just all on on YouTube because I can't figure out <laughs> the, putting it on the internet any other way. Well, and I know how to do it, but I've been okay. Lazy is not the right word. We're we're just, you were busy. Yeah, we're busy. Yeah, Tilly we're and I busy. are Tilly and I are trying to find a house right now, and you know you're trying to run a business and and chasing a child. So he's been the. He's been an extra handful lately. So. <laughs> He's been but a yeah. handful. Nice, yeah. man. So, so what's so, what's going on in, in your guitar world? In in your wait, <laughs> we can't say that. We can't that's say that. That's the guitar knobs. Yeah, that's guitar knobs. Shout out to guitar knobs. What's up, guys? We're tr- we're trying not to rip off your your thing here, but we want to talk about what's been going on in our our guitar Gu- world. Gu- guitar planets. Guitar. Pl- <laughs> we'll workshop that. Our guitar solar system. Mm. Um. Man, not too much. Well, actually, I will. I do have something to show. Stand by. I've got a new guitar on the way. This is exciting. <clears throat> so, uh, another wide, one. I know. I know. Uh, wide Sky guitars. You hip to mm-hmm. Wide Sky? Yeah, I I saw it in one of your videos uh, where you were at Righteous Guitars. Right? Yes. So See? Patch, the uh, the owner proprietary proprietor owner proprietor builder of, of wide sky guitars out in taos new mexico uh sent me this yesterday this is uh this is gonna ship on monday or not monday because monday's labor day but this is my new my new wide sky and uh i am beyond excited about this thing i've, I've played a couple of patches guitars um i Gary can't Clark- see it oh sorry there yeah there you go oh, okay yeah um Gary Clark Jr. has been playing these for a while now, and Patch is one of the most humble and down-to-earth and cool people I've ever met. Uh, he's become a friend, and yeah. as soon as traveling makes more sense for Tilly and I, we're actually going to fly out to Taos, and I want to make like a little sort of mini documentary uh, of him and his uh, what he's doing, because it's really, really cool. So, Very, yeah. Is it is just him? Yeah, as far as I know, it's just him. Um, cool. So yeah, he's he's a total total sweetheart. The, those style of guitars, I've I've start started to see more and more people kind of doing s- similar things. Cause like before, I saw that I saw the um, the B and G, like the little sister mm-hmm. sort of thing, uh, and I played one of those. Um, it was pretty cool. And yeah. you know what's funny? Uh, Maybach, Maybach, like the car Are company. No, no, no. Uh, they're a German guitar company. Okay. Uh, and they mostly make G and F style guitars. Uh, most of their guitars, like their, their main guitar is called the Lester. Ah. Uh, but they're making a new one that looks very similar to that. And I was kind of like, huh. Because I, th- they're not, I don't know if they're made in Germany. I don't know like what the story is. I know they're based out of Germany. Those right, crazy like, Germans, man. Like the... Um... <laughs> The Duesenberg saga. <laughs> yeah. What are we gonna get sued if we talk about that? I, I don't know. Maybe I don't know. They got more money than we do, probably. <laughs> what the what? what? They're they're not actually okay. Well, we should clarify. Uh, Duesenbergs are at least some portion of the guitar. Maybe it's all of the guitar. Maybe it's just some of the guitar. We don't know. Yeah. But mm-hmm. some portion of the guitars of Duesenberg guitars are actually made in Korea. They're not made in Germany. We found yeah. that out recently on Instagram that a lot of people think they're actually made in Germany, but they're not. They're I think yeah. they're finished in Germany, whatever that means. Yeah, uh, and I think a lot of the hardware is, you know, done. Like I think all the final setup and prep work for sure are done there. Uh, just like a lot of people do that, you know, in the states, like PRS and Revolta and Schechter do that. Yeah. Um, but. But yeah, it's it's kind of an odd situation because there's no clear answer as to exactly where all of the guitar is put together. Because yeah. you look at guys like the new Fano guitar uh, company, and like some of those guitars, the bodies and stuff, they say they're 
assembled in the U S but they're not like made in the U S um, which is fine. You know, like you get a company in Mexico to cut the bodies or whatever, you know, like Fender's Ensenada factory is like what, like half an hour away from their American factory. Yeah. Like, is it that big a deal? You know? Right. So, but it, it is an odd thing that there's no, like I've looked it up. I've talked to a lot of people and no one has ever been able to find out definitively where those guitars are put together. Yeah, I think they're good guitars. Like, don't, don't get me they wrong. Are. I played a lot of Duesenbergs over the years. I have a lot of friends that own Duesenbergs. Um, I like their their big sort of semi-hollow kind of 335 Gretsch sort of thing that they do. Um, uh-huh. I think they're too much money for what they are, specifically, yeah. because they're not... I think they're 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 charging as if they are handcrafting guitars in Germany, but yeah, yeah. And, and that like that's that's a slippery slope because I mean really the only limitation for building a guitar is like how much you're willing to put into it, you know. Mm-hmm. Like there's no reason why anywhere in the world shouldn't be able to produce a guitar that costs X amount of money, like a really expensive guitar, but you know, there is you do ha- kind of have to meet expectations, I think. Yeah. When, yeah. When, you, when things are made certain places. Yeah. So that's but. that's uh, that's what's going on for me. I got the wide sky on the way. Um, that's awesome. Very 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 like fortunate and uh, privileged to be to be able to get one of those guitars. I really feel lucky, man. Patches. That, <laughs> super yeah. cool. And they that you just recently got a mule, right? Yes, I'm looking at it right now. Yeah. I would reach over oh. and grab it, but there's such a cacophony of like cables. <laughs> and oh, lights yeah. and uh tripods between me and my guitar rack that you'll have to imagine it or maybe zach you can drop in a picture of it um in post there it is yep the mule um bam matt matt ike up in saginaw michigan another person who i've gotten to know recently we met at nam at winter nam mm-hmm. um and yeah, it's another one of those people that's just running, just building really, really amazing instruments, man. Um, he's right. another person that I want to go up and do that sort of documentary series thing with. So, right. yeah, that that kind of ties into what has been going on for me lately. I have felt, and we we talk about this a lot. I felt the need to purge, mm. like, and I don't I don't know if it's just because. I don't really have a lot of opportunities to play as much stuff as I would like because I'm so busy building things, you know, but when I come in here to actually play, I kind of get overwhelmed with the level of stuff I have. And it's not even like, I don't have that much stuff, you know, but I'm sure you've, you've been there where you have something and you just like, you kind of get burnt out or disappointed and just like you want something else. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And that's exactly how I've felt over the past week or so. And so I recently started throwing stuff up online to, um, to try to not shuffle the deck, but just purge. I don't even have anything I necessarily want to buy. I don't need to buy anything. I just want to like clear up space for the inevitability when I do buy something. Yeah. Yeah. So how do you like to sell gear? What's your preferred method of selling gear? (sighs) Man, I, I love buying gear. I love it. I love going and buying stuff, but I genuinely hate selling things. Uh, it mainly big things like pedals. Fine. Like throw them on reverb. I'm fine with eating the percent because it's just easy. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I'm, I always like fall victim to, I'm going to put it on Craigslist. I'm going to put it on Facebook. And then you just get the run around long conversations that don't go anywhere. Um, and it just drives me crazy. And usually what ends up happening is I'll just like take them to a shop and trade them. Really? Uh, yeah. That that yeah. usually is w- what will happen. I'll get so annoyed that like, I'm just going to trade it for something else. The the old uh, the old GameStop method, right? You come in with all your, your Xbox <laughs> yeah. games and they're like, yeah, that all those together are worth about $8. So. <laughs> right. <laughs> you can use that to pre-order the new PlayStation. Mm-hmm. Uh, Man, I uh, yeah, that's that's what always happens. I'll just I've, like, I don't know. I've given up on Craigslist altogether. I gave up on Craigslist years ago because there's always that air, at least for me, of like, mm, this could be a scam, and I could <laughs> yeah, yeah. go to this Kroger parking lot to meet this guy to sell this pedal train board, and he could murder me. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I don't. I don't, I don't like I've, that. 
I've done a lot of Craigslist deals and I've never had any like bad like situations. Uh, and I feel really lucky, but I'm also like super cautious. Like meet me yeah. in the middle of the day in a crowded area, you know, uh, people want to come like try a guitar or an amp, like, nope, you know, you can yeah. take it. You, I'll take your money. If it doesn't work, call me. I will make it right. But you can't come in my house. No, yeah. I'm not doing that. Yeah. So. I had a lot of bad experiences like in high school with a, a good friend of mine growing up. His his dad was one of those guys that was always just wheeling and dealing and trading and buying stuff, just random stuff on Craigslist all the time. Like I'd go over to their house and his dad be like, all right, boys, listen. Uh, I know you're trying to hang out today, but you need to take the pickup truck. You need to drive an hour away. There's a couch. You're going to pick the couch up <laughs> and you're going to, I'm not kidding. This is like, we had to do this all the time. You're going to, and then you're going to take it to this guy. You're going to sell it. Don't take less than $50 for it. You're going to take that money and you're going to go to this guy and you're going to buy this, these golf clubs and you're going to come back. <laughs> and I remember getting roped in that kind of stuff. They had, my friend would have a new car a different car, not a new car, but he would have a different car every three weeks because his right, dad would yeah. like find it. Oh man, there's this 2004 Nissan Frontier. It's a good price. I'm going to buy that. And then they drive that literally for two weeks and then he'd find something else and flip it and trade it and everything. And I just got so, when you're doing stuff like that, um, you meet and run into a lot of very interesting people. Oh, in- De- like, Dealing in cars is like, it's a different kind of person. <laughs> yeah. I Not know. always in a bad way, but interesting, interesting people for yeah. sure. <laughs> I remember one day he had us load up a trailer full of scrap metal. We had to like go around and pick up like a washing machine and a bunch of just <laughs> random, it was garbage. And then we had to drive like an hour and a half outside of Atlanta to go to the scrap yard to get like 85 bucks worth of, <laughs> it was like, oh my God. <laughs> He had you in the in the backyard with a fire pit stripping copper wire and <laughs> that, yeah. now that is a southern thing that most people probably have no idea about. Oh yeah, or like pulling uh what is it, pulling compressors stuff out of um out of uh air conditioning air units. Yep, yeah, yeah, that's a big problem. Or cutting <laughs> yeah. catalytic converters out of cars. Oh yeah. Gosh, it's so redneck. It's like the most <laughs> redneck thing. Oh my god! And to clarify, right. my friend and his dad aren't rednecks, and they—they're not. They, you know, they didn't need the money. This is right. just like a hobby that my friend's dad had. Oh. And he just did for fun on the side, and boy, people love trading and stuff. I mean, like, and you can see that too on like, th- there's groups on like the the gear. Um, it's not the gear page. It's um, there's one Facebook group, um, on 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 Facebook. <laughs> Good. All right. Yep. Clarify <laughs> that, that. Um. Like, and I don't know if you follow any any of these like big trading Facebook pages, but like they'll have the guys that have like every month they'll have like ten or twenty like new like nice guitars that they've wheeled and dealed, and it's the same dude because it's the same kind of picture on the same rug, you know. And it's just like, like, do you make money off of this, or is this just like for fun? Like I don't, because it's a lot of work. Like for me, it's a lot of work. I just couldn't do it, but. Of all this stuff I posted recently, because I posted a bunch of pedals. Right. Because I have a lot of stuff. Like, there's a lot of things I like, and there's a lot of things that I'm like, if I plug it up and play it, I'll be like, eh, I'll keep it. But I don't really need it. Mm-hmm. And I did have a guy offer me for a fair amount of pedals, but a lot of them, like, you know, I got for very cheap or traded for. Uh, he He's wanting to trade me an American Standard Telly for, like, a handful of pedals. Okay. And I don't have a Telly, so... Mm. It's a 2003. Okay. Um, what color know, is just it? Just looks like the it's sunburst with a okay. you know, white guard. Not much wear. There's a little like finish coming off on the neck near the cowboy cord area on the side. It's got a rosewood board. Okay. I don't know. I, I think I might do it. What do you think? Would you do it if you didn't have a telly? Well, yeah. So a telly is one of those staple guitars. Like you got to have, right. I think, you got to have a telly or telly-like guitar. Because you can, mm-hmm. it's one of those things, man. You can do everything on a telly. Right. I mean, look at look at John Five. You know, like, <laughs> look at him. Look at him. Look at all the stuff he can do. Just look at him. Would yeah. you just look yeah. at him? 
I'm I'm actually a huge fan of John uh, Five, dude. He's he's it, such a he's incredible. Basket. So good, man. Um, there there's there's a video on YouTube of him playing like all these like because he has like every Telecaster, like you know broadcaster, no caster, telecast, like everything. Yep. And there's a video of him playing a bunch of vintage stuff. Yep. Mm-hmm. And have you seen it? And it's like it sounds mm-hmm. horrendous. <laughs> I don't remember uh, like what it, it sounds like. It's been a few years since I've seen that. If if it's the video that I'm thinking of, it's it's oh, five or like six inter- years old. Interview style. Yeah. Yeah, we'll have to find it and link it. But it like cuz he's so incredible. Like his his ability is just out of this world and then like you're like, "What are you doing? Like what are you running through?" you know? Yeah. But I mean, that's something like cuz you and I were texting cuz recently I got suckered into buying some insanely expensive pickups. <laughs> What do you mean you got suckered into buying it? Because the way what? I remember it going down is you like <laughs> you did a bunch of research, uh, and <laughs> you were like super stoked on it. So that's true. That yeah, suckered <laughs> is I maybe that's I fell victim to the hype. I think okay. is what I, okay. I did. Is that being a sucker? I don't know. Maybe yes. Well, hmm, that's an interesting question. Falling victim to hype is hmm. Let's explore this. So I think being a sucker is falling victim to hype is definitely a part of it, but it's also not doing due diligence and yeah. just kind of like blindly going into something, which is not you. So I wouldn't R- call well, no. you a sucker in that regard. Um, but are, are we going to name the pickups? Are we going to call them out? Are we going to put them on blast or what? Well, I mean, oh, they, they do sound really good, but I did spend an obscene amount of money on the uh, cream tea whisker bucker humbuckers recently are those the one that came in the box that looked like yeah the les paul top yeah it, yeah it looks like a flame flame maple like les paul top yeah and then you open it and they're like there's a picture of a les paul and they're like sitting where the pickups are well that's what you're paying for man this is packaging the unboxing absolutely experience. absolutely it was, it was pretty cool like I'll, I'll admit like when i got it opened it i was like this is neat <laughs> but they so these pickups if you don't know because Cream Tea has been making pickups for Billy Gibbons for like a while. And they yeah. make pickups like Keith Richards, I think, uses one of their pickups. Like they make a lot of cool gear for cool people. Yeah. And these pickups are supposedly like an exact copy of Pearlie's pickups out of the Les Paul, the 59. And they are really good. They're not very balanced, but that's true to PAF form. But the guy they've had doing demos for them is Tom Quayle, who is... A monster of a guitar player. I love Tom. But he doesn't do a Billy Gibbons sort of thing. So when he like demos them, it just sounds like him playing any other humbucker guitar, in my opinion. It's just which is weird. not a, a weird which choice. is not a bad thing because Tom no. is such a badass guitar player. Like if you don't know Tom Quayle, first of all, I feel like everyone if you're on YouTube and, and you're deep enough in the guitar YouTube niche to be on our channel, then you you know about Tom Quayle and you've seen his videos. But in case you haven't, you should go check him out. He's been on YouTube. He's like one of the OG guitar YouTube guys. I remember yeah. watching his videos in like 2010, 2011. Yeah. 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 He's been in the game a long time, but it, it was just an odd choice in my opinion. Well, I think uh, that I think the idea is to get someone because Tom is a super versatile player and that he can cover yeah. a lot of different ground. And so if I'm a, if I'm a pickup manufacturer, you know, I'm I think there's two ways to go about it, right? You get someone who is really really versatile and can cover a lot of different ground, especially if you're a pickup manufacturer and you're bringing somebody into demo pickups that and you you're going to do the pearly gates for one video and then you've got something completely different for another video. You want to bring one guy in who can do everything and do it well. Yeah. Tom Quayle is your guy. I understand what you're saying though. It's like if you're trying to demo a super specific thing, like hey, these pickups are for someone who's like a big ZZ Top fan, wants that Pearly Gates thing, wants that 59 Les Paul PAF kind of thing. Yeah, get somebody who like just does that thing super, super well and has that thing yeah. super dialed. But I, I, I watched that video, the cream tea thing, and I was like, yeah, it doesn't sound like Billy Gibbons, but mm-hmm. I think it sounds like Tom Quayle, and I think that yeah. sounds pretty damn good. So Yeah, yeah, it, it's, it, it does sound great, but it, it's just an interesting... Uh, just an interesting choice because like when I, when, whenever I try to demo a pedal and, and, you know, showcase what something can do, I want it to be 
kind of living in the realm in which it was designed. Uh, and not to say that you should limit your scope in that in that way, but uh, just just funny. I don't know. It, like it made me laugh because on that video I sent you, he said, "We'll play some ZZ Top style things," and I was like, "Where? <laughs> Where are they? I need more of them." <laughs> oh yeah. But so anyway. what what do you what what about the pickups? Are you not digging? What are you not happy with? You know, they sound good, but they're really unbalanced. So the neck pickup is, it's not significantly higher output than the bridge, but it's just enough that when you're in your neck position, it's pretty loud. Mm -hmm. And when you click down to the bridge, there's a significant dip in volume. Is that and true I don't, to Pearly Gates? It Apparently, you know, apparently they're the same outputs. I mean, it's, a, it's like there are copies. Hmm. He's got like this computer system and all sorts of like, Technology specifically designed to copy everything about a pickup. Um, so, I mean, even if it is exactly how Pearly is, I, I, I want something that I can use every position, you yeah. know, all the time, and I don't have to worry about like, oh, if I'm going to have my neck pickup on, I got to have my volume rolled back so they balance yeah. because I like balance because that's something we talked about in our our first failed attempt episode that didn't <laughs> that didn't make it. We talked about how, like, if we're going to go for humbuckers, they have to be balanced. Yeah. So. Yeah, I, but, I agree. Yeah, I, I pulled them out. So that's that's the thing, though, is like when you're when you're stepping into the realm of artist gear, of like signature gear or clones of famous things, like you are kind of stepping into someone else's um, preference, for example, right? Like, yep. yeah. I think part of the reason I have never really connected with strats for a long time is the only strat that I have it's conveniently right here. Is this one? John Myers. This is a John Myers custom black <laughs> one. Um, this is one of the special editions one. I bought this in 2012 from the original owner. Um, this is probably the best gear investment I've ever made. It wasn't. Mm -hmm. It wasn't on purpose, but I paid like I think 1,800 bucks for this in oh, 2012. Maybe I think I paid 2,000 for it. I can't remember. I had to borrow the money, or I've had to borrow some money from my dad and then pay him back. Um, but I needed a strat at the time. This one was super cool. They only made 500 of these came with like the special in case case and everything like that. Yeah. And, uh, I just had it over at righteous guitars, getting some work done on it. And I was like, man, what are these going for? And I looked it up on reverb and I think the last one that sold was last year sometime. And I think it sold for close to five grand. Yeah. You I, can fact I, I check believe me it. on that, but I, I believe it because I mean I had a normal John Mayer strat that I de John Mayerified, <laughs> like changed the pick guard, changed the pickups, did everything, and um, sold it for okay money. And then like a year later is when he quit Fender, and I was like, damn it. Ooh. Well, okay, <laughs> I so my kept that guitar. My point is that like yeah, this is this is not you know now knowing what I know and and everything, this is not how I would choose to spec out a Stratocaster the the pickups mm -hmm. are way too mid scooped for me specifically yeah. the bridge pickup and it's very very bright and ice picky um you know the neck I like but the neck on this is is literally just a, an SRB yeah it, it's yeah. that's what it is um but yeah I think I think when you're getting into the world of like custom artist signature gear you can sometimes fall into that what you're talking about with the cream tees which I, I, I don't know. I've never played them, so I don't know what they sound like. But yeah, if that's true to the pearly gates, then that's I think that's what you're buying, right? Right. In all oh, of absolutely. its flaws. So Yeah. Yep. Well, so, so you're gonna sell them or what? I don't know. I think I'm gonna keep them. <laughs> because it's like I have no set number twenty one mm. and like they are cool, you know. And I put I put I had extra set of um throwback pickup covers so i put the covers on it so they look really nice and uh, i'm really anal about pickup covers on les paul's uh so i'll probably just hang on to them you know they, they're not eating anything as they say you could you could put them back in the box and just whenever you want go through that unboxing experience again just like, oh wow <laughs> right. wow look at this <laughs> all right back on the shelf yeah wow that was great i'll do that again next week <laughs> right no, I think what you'll so, probably end up doing is you'll get some guitar or something. Those are cool pickups to have around to 
to use as like a project hot rod kind of thing. Like, oh man, I, like maybe this telly you get on trade, you're like, you know what? Screw it. I'm gonna route it for a neck pickup and I'm gonna throw that <laughs> that cream tea in there. And, you know, oh, why man. not, man? The, here's a good topic of conversation. Have you ever done any guitar work yourself oh, that you were boy. severely ashamed of? <laughs> because Zach, I have. Zach, <laughs> I tried my hand at relicking the first <laughs> the first parts guitar i ever bought and it's a shame man i didn't know what i was doing um i bought a 1986 japanese squire strat one of the e serial numbers which yeah those those are cool yeah the the the, the japanese squire stuff is like actually pretty cool from the 80s and they're going up in value. This one was a yeah. basket case, though. I mean, it was like, it was trashed, dude. And it was also really heavy. Like the body, I mean, it was like a nine or, it was like a nine pound strap. Gah. Yeah. But I got it on Craigslist. It was a super cheap deal. And um, yeah, I put a new neck on it, put pickups in it and everything. And then I was like, I know what I'll do. I'll paint it and then I'll relic it. And, it's not not understanding that hey it's a it's a polyurethane finish and polyurethane finishes don't no I tried to relic it first it was Olympic white I tried to relic it first not understanding that poly doesn't wear and relic right also not knowing what I was doing and uh, just ruined it I ruined the guitar basically and then I painted it <laughs> seafoam green with that like guitar re ranch stuff and didn't do yeah. the prep work right because I don't know what I'm doing. And sprayed I sprayed nitrocellulose over polyurethane because I didn't strip the body. Hey, and it looked terrible. And then I tried relicking that. <laughs> that guitar yeah, that... will never see the light of day. I'll never show it. Do you, you still have it? Yeah, of course. But oh, what am man. I going to do with it? It's not worth anything, and I can't. I mean, oh. I guess I give it to somebody, but you should you should really like strip it and like do it right. No, because I like, I like, Zach, I. It's a reminder to not do that again. (laughs) No, I like took a screwdriver to the body, like (laughs) relic. It's, it's shameful what I did. It is truly shameful. (laughs) What I I did to that guitar. uh, I think that's hilarious. I tried to relic a guitar once, my first guitar. uh, And all I did, because I had this um, Strat copy. And on the back, on the belt, because I was like, I'm only going to do it on the back. I don't want to, like, if, if I mess this up, I don't want anybody to see it. <laughs> so at the on the belly contour, I, like, took a pocket knife and just, like, like scratched the paint off. Uh, and to be fair, like, it looks okay, but it looks stupid. You know, like, <laughs> it doesn't look real. So, um, so what, that, what, yeah. what's your take on relicking overall? <sighs> I I mean I think you and I would probably agree on on most things relic related. I like relic guitars when they're done tastefully and they're done realistically. There's a lot of people doing relics without naming names. Uh, I'll I'll try to avoid stepping on any toes here. That relic guitars just with reckless abandon mm. and put wear and tear and remove paint in places a hand will never touch. Mm-hmm. So. You know, as long as something's done right, I'm totally cool with it. And I think it just adds to the story, even if, you know, that story is road worn and it's like like a road worn fender. Like anyone else can buy that guitar and have the same basic thing. You can still make it yours a lot easier. Well, like you can't make a poly finished guitar wear. Like yeah. unless you, you know, take a knife and screwdriver and sandpaper to it. Yeah. It's it's you're not really going to get through it. That that coating is like a it, jawbreaker. It's plastic. Yeah, yeah, it, it 100% yeah. plastic. And even to that end, and this is something that a lot of people don't understand, modern nitro has plasticizers in it that keeps it from relicking. Like uh Gibson's nitro will not relic the same as vintage Gibson nitro, like current Gibson nitro. Right. It'll it'll check and crack, but it's so much more durable than the old stuff. And that's so. probably partially because of modern like safety and environmental regulations, right? Like you, you can't yeah. the old stuff and, and I'm not complaining about that at all because 
um, you know, human life and people's health and well-being in the environment is way more important than what type of nitro you spray on your guitar. Um, right. But yeah, I think it is the the formulations are completely different. I was talking to somebody recently about, and when I say recently, this was at some point in the last twelve to twenty four months. Um, <laughs> so. But I remember talking to somebody who builds guitars in California, or they do, I don't remember what it was, but the thing I have in my mind is you can't spray nitro in California because it's illegal. Right, yeah. Yeah, there, there are strict government regulations on spraying that type of paint. Just like in some states, like painting cars, you can only use certain types of finishes on cars. Uh, so, yeah, it's it's not modern nitro is not the same. And a lot of Fender guitars that have nitro have a poly undercoat mm. because ultimately they want to protect that paint. They want to protect that body. Um, and you know, th but when it comes to relicking from like custom guitar builders, like, like Novo, uh, and people like that, I think it's great. Like, yeah. Go for it. Yeah. I like from from my perspective, I agree. I'm pro relic <clears throat> most times when it's done well. I don't even necessarily care about being done right. Like, I, would this guitar ever would this guitar ever age like this? No, probably well, not. I mean, like when you look at this, or like what would you have to do to get this guitar <laughs> to wear right there? You know what I mean? Like that's that's totally unrealistic. I don't care. I think it's right. rad and I like the way it looks. <laughs> and um, for me, it's also a feel thing because the back, the thing that Dennis does incredibly well are the necks um, and, right. and the yeah. wear on the neck and the playing surface like this to me. And, and I have added to this from when I bought it because I've played the ever loving shit out of this guitar. But um, this feels old and broken in to me and it feels mm -hmm. comfortable and it felt like that the day i bought it it felt like right. this guitar had been played for 50 years the day that i picked it up from the shop so um and it's it's cool man this the thing that i like about relicking is that it makes your guitar completely unique mm -hmm. you know i know a lot of people have tried to spec this guitar from novo and they've sold a lot of them because of this yeah. particular one but not a single one they've made even people that have tried to clone this guitar, none of them look like this one. Right. They don't. Yeah. And that's a good point. Like, honestly, if I had to just have a relic neck, I'd be cool with that. Because that, I mean, that's what it's all about. And like my Novo is, it's over there. It's not within reach. <laughs> um, the neck is, is nicely worn on that. The body's not really all that beat. Um, but the one thing that kind of drives me crazy is like seeing rel relic, um, like really heavy relicking inside cutaways, especially on strats. Cause I think arguably the most relic guitars you see floating around are strats and tellies. Yep. Um, and like people who do like really heavy relicking inside the cutaways, like you, your hands aren't in there a lot. Yeah. Like it would take a lot of playing and a lot of rubbing to like wear the finish off there. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I, and to that end, I have seen relic to amps. Fender's done some and like they're all right. <laughs> like they did a series of relic pro juniors and uh, blues juniors. I think they were like lacquered tweed. They had like, like drink rings on them and stuff. Did you see those? No, like, it was, this was years ago. But why do I have an initially bad gut reaction to that? Am I a hypocrite? <laughs> I <know that. sighs> I Maybe I, I don't because I, I, I feel that way about relict pedals. Yeah, what? Ooh, I don't like that. <laughs> yeah, what? Hold on, because I, I have seen the relict pedals and I'm like, that's lame. Yeah, but I yeah. like relict guitars, so why don't? See, I think, I'm the same way. Uh, yeah, uh, amps amps don't bother me as much because I think it's kind of cool for like a tweed amp when you, when it's a lacquered tweed. And you, you know, there's like frayed edges and stuff yeah. like, and you could do that with a pocket knife. That's okay. Cool. Right. But, but a pedal that has scratches and like the powder coat seat roll or paint, whatever's on it is like rubbed off all over it. It's like, 
like I've seen a lot of vintage pedals over the years and most of them are in fine condition, you know, unless it's like really been toured like yeah. every day of its life. Well, I think here's the thing with the pedals that bothers me. With a guitar, when you relic a guitar, you're relicking the whole guitar. Well, actually, no, that there's a hole in that logic too. I was going to say that if you if you have a single relic pedal on your pedal board, it's like oh, just that one relic. But it, it, that doesn't matter because you could oh yeah, that that pedal's old. I have a vintage tube screamer or whatever. Um, right. And most pedals, I don't think, have really been around. Well, I don't think that's true either. I think I'm just uh, I think I'm just a hypocrite, man. <laughs> just grumpy about I'm it. I'm just don't, a I don't like it. curmudgeonly old. Hey, I don't like that. And that goes into what we were talking about last week of guitar players being um, very fundamentalist and dogmatic in there. That's yeah. an example of me just being a fundamentalist, closed minded ass. <laughs> yeah. If you're going to have one relic pedal, your whole board has to be beaten up. If you want a relic you guitar, to open that's it, fine. But if you relic an it. amp, so help me God, coming for Have you, you ever had an amp that was just so filthy like in and out that you, you're like how did this even happen has that ever have mm -mm. you ever had anything like that oh no my, i had a dr z that was like that my uh the tweed that i built uh, about two years ago now mm. is pretty dirty but that's because i i used it on the road for a year straight i, I took it out and it was right. either my main amp or it was a backup amp. So it basically went with me everywhere. And it doesn't have a case or anything. So it just it would just get thrown in the back of a trailer. It got rained on like four or five times. Um, with Noah? Yeah, we yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> yep, sure did. It got, man, July 3rd. This was such a traumatic experience. July 3rd, 2019, uh, just outside of St. Louis, Missouri was the worst one i made a video about it a year ago but that was that was terrible we got rained out two songs in and it was a festival kind of thing a bunch of other mm -hmm. country acts or whatever and because there was lightning we had to clear the stage but the other crews for the other bands went and moved all of their gear back and covered their gear up and didn't touch our gear so <laughs> we weren't allowed on stage and we're just watching our stuff just get soaked. And that, that tweet oh, amp man. was was part of it. And uh uh yeah. But it's fine. No, it started making a weird oh. noise actually after that. <laughs> and I to be fair, I haven't played it really since. It started making a weird noise and I've just been kinda like, I don't I don't want to deal with it. I'm gonna mm. <laughs> put it in the corner. Yeah, I uh I have a or I had a Doctor Z that Outside, it had been played. It was old. Uh, it had been, you know, the Tolex was all beaten up. And um, all the pots were scratchy. And I was like, I'm going to clean this. So I took the, the chassis out. And the entire circuit board was covered in dirt. Like, like you could you could barely scratch it off with your fingernail covered in dirt. How does but that happen? I don't know. Like, it doesn't make any sense. Like, it looked like it had just, like, the chassis had been sitting out in, like, a barn or something. Um Ew. The whole thing was caked in dirt, but it sounded so good that I said, I'll never clean the dirt. I'm just going to clean the pots and the jacks and the tube sockets. <laughs> oh, so. my God. You really think the Mojo dirt, dirt. had – you think that added something to the amp? Why would you risk taking it away? Because it could create some kind of serious problem inside the amp? D dirt isn't conductive, and it was stuck. It's fine. <laughs> Oh my god! Oh my god! That that brings up an interesting topic. Do you ever quietly judge someone uh, based on the state of their gear? Um, I probably would have years ago, but now not so much. Like, I mean, the, the there are a few things that really irk me, like when guitars or basses or mainly when guitars or basses are like really dirty. Mm. Like a fingerboard is just caked in like it's kind of gross. Greasy dirt. Yeah. Like the you can see it on the edge of the frets. Uh or when people don't clip the strings on the tuners and they're just Yeah, like oh, that's that's offensive to me. <sighs> like that's offensive. <laughs> I get it if you had to run off stage and like change a string real quick. Totally fine. But if you just you pull it out of a case and you've got six wires like flying everywhere. 
no excuse. No, you, you. I think if if you're the type of person that does that, mm-mm. yeah, there's mm-mm. not into that, not into. That. <laughs> I'm 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 uh, kind of in the middle. I don't like either extreme. Okay, so if we, you know, I've been uh, I've played with other guitar players. For me, it's pedal boards. Okay, mm. they pull a pedal board out of their case, and it's just, it's like. They literally were like, oh, I've got to go to rehearsal in five minutes. Uh, I guess I'll just put all of this stuff on the board and then just close the case, and that'll be my pedal board. <laughs> and then they left it right. like that for four years. Um, mm-hmm. That that really drives me nuts. But then there's the other side of it, too. I've played with guitar players that are like, they treat it, it's like a, it's like a, they treat their guitars like a gun. Like they, right, yeah. after they're done playing it, you know, they open their case and they pull out and they like buff every little thing off and they're like wiping the strings down and they're like wiping the neck down. It's like, dude, it just it's fine. It'll be fine. You yeah. can you can clean it when you restring it. You'll be it's gonna you're okay if it gets a scratch on it. You know, uh, so it's a guitar. It's a guitar. You know. Yeah. So I'm I'm yeah, I, right in the middle on that. I uh, only really clean the necks and the fingerboards on my guitars. That's about. And it's usually like when I restring, I'll, I'll spray some cleaner. And um, if it's rosewood, every third or fourth restring, I'll treat the rosewood. Yeah, um, totally that, fine. That's about it. But I had a buddy that he toured with like a serious country act, like a you know headliner, and he didn't even have a pedal board. <laughs> like he had a bag with pedals in it that he would set on stage. No, dude. And I was like, dude, I gave him a pedal board. I was like, just, just have this. Like you're embarrassing me and I can't have it anymore. So I just gave him a pedal board and a power supply. It's like, just figure it out. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's like, look to each his own. Right. And if, if that works and he's got the gig and he sounds good with that rig, by all means, man, whatever blows your skirt up. But right. <laughs> It, just please put it on a board. It's fine. You can make a board. Make a board. Just go go buy a five dollar plastic cutting board from from Target and put. There's yeah. your pedal board. Just do that. You know. Um, yeah, a, a two by six is cheap. Yeah. <laughs> yes, they are. <laughs> so I wanna I wanna bring this up here because this has um, I saw this on on the internet today on Guitar.com, and uh, I'm not gonna lie. Uh-oh. It kind of uh, it kind of sent me. Well, it, it got me thinking. So here we go. Window capture. Fender lends a hand with its Mojo Grip. <laughs> okay. Let me switch over to uh, scroll down here. Ever watched a plectrum fly out between sweaty fingers midway through a solo? Fender has debuted its own entry into the niche of products aiming to stop that from happening. The Fender Mojo Grip is a nitrile rubber sleeve that provides a better gripping service, surface and service probably, an extra thickness to a standard shaped guitar pick. When purchased, the grips come with a celluloid pick already in place. Well, that's nice. Uh, but as the as the grip is separate, you can easily replace picks when they wear down or break. Um, medium heavy classic picks. They are six. Oh, pa- okay. Packs of three oh. for six dollars a piece. This is the, in my opinion, such a just gimmicky unneeded <laughs> guitar gadget what it yep. who who has ever needed i've been playing guitar for almost 20 years and i've never once thought you know what i need a condom for my guitar picks so that i don't let them go flying all over the place i feel like right. we solved this issue when we got picks that had textures on them <laughs> right and the cool thing about those is, like, the Edge figured out, or uh, plenty of players have figured out, turn it sideways and you get an, a really cool tone. I, I'm right there with you, but you know what's really funny? Is in my retail experience, those Dava picks, remember those? Yep, yep. Because some of those had, like, a, a rubber back thing. We sold a ton of those, and I don't understand, you know. I... I don't understand the 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 gimmicky thing either because I feel like there's probably most picks like it's mostly picks that fall into that gimmicky realm of things. There's a lot of like unnecessary plectrums floating yep. around there. Yep. But it is like like 
are they not making enough money off Stratocasters or something? Like, I don't, why do they need to do this? That? Is this is what I think, right? Fender's a big corporation, okay, right? And just like any corporation, any company, their uh, their their goal is to make money. Totally fine, no problem with that at all. This has got to just be a. It's I think it's targeted at beginners, and yeah. it probably costs them it's six bucks a pack. It's got to cost them fifteen cents to make those three. Oh. The I packaging mean, costs more than the picks. Yeah, the the margin on that thing has got to just be insane, and they know yeah. they're going to put them on shelves at guitar centers and all these big box stores, or they'll they'll put them on their website, and somebody who's there buying their first guitar is going to see that, and they're going to think, oh yeah, I need this, because of course, how else are you going to hold a pick without a right. rubber condom on it? Like that seems just weird. I'm not just going to have regular picks, and they're probably thinking this is like a little side hustle, you know, cost them nothing. It, easy to ship. They probably throw them. I used to oh. work a retail job years ago, so I, I know how companies ship products and stuff. They'll throw them in with some other box, and they'll just it's just pure profit. But yeah. I, it's so unnecessary that it makes me mad. <laughs> I I'm right there with you. I I totally totally agree. Um, the, the, there's a lot of stuff that I mean, and I think this is like every hobby there's probably just a Uh bunch of unnecessary accessories but guitar there definitely seems to be a lot of just try to like cash grab (laughs) sort of things that that are at the you know at they're at the checkout Uh, it's just like candy at a a, grocery store or something i know i've bought that stuff before i'm trying to think i'm looking around i'm like i know i've got some gimmicky guitar crap here that i've i bought some of these these uh and this isn't a gimmick it's it's an interesting idea those uh rombo picks have you seen these uh they do all these kind of interesting uh shapes and um textured have you seen these yet or i can't see that oh, even though on our that. on our video it looks like i can see that oh that's cool and they do um uh let's see I'm trying to interesting uh picks and i think i think they're made in germany i think so um, speaking of picks let's let's talk about some non-gimmicky guitar picks okay okay uh, or, these, or these the, aren't gimmicky by the way i th- i think these are good all right so let me see i got a, i got a whole this is my uh my little concrete um thing that's actual concrete by the way i bought it at the container store because why not um so i i like heavy picks right V pick. Uh-huh. I'm a big fan of the V pick stuff. I don't know if you've used any of the. Yeah, I got a peso pick here. Nice. Yep. Big fan of like the cool V picks. I like mm-hmm. picks that have interesting textures on them. There's one in here that I'm trying to find. Um, that has it's the Keith Urban signature one. Have you seen that from Dadario? Is that the one that comes with his Home Shopping Network guitar? <laughs> no. <laughs> 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 no, it's not. Okay. Damn it. Where is it? No, it's it's actually a really cool pick that D'Addario makes for Keith Urban. Guilty has... until proven otherwise. <laughs> yeah. All right, I don't have it. Oh, speaking of the edge, these are the edge picks, by the way. These uh these nylon, I forget who makes them, uh, but they're the they have that that texture. That is the the texture, the sound of uh like where the streets have no name and everything. He turns mm-hmm. that turns that pick sideways. Oh, okay. Uh, it's a medium see what do we have here nylon west germany is what it says on it so that's an old pick right there yeah i use the herco uh holy grail um it's like the they're, they're kind of like the dunlop textured like the classic gray picks. right yep uh but dunlop bought herco and herco makes uh, these new holy grail ones and they're great but they're you know it's a pretty basic pick yeah I don't know. yeah i have hundreds of picks <laughs> so here's the deal guys don't buy that kind of shit please because what what happens is people companies like fender they see that and they see oh man we sold twenty thousand units of these pick condoms and uh that that means we're just going to make more of them and we're going to continue to come up with gimmicky unneeded crap like that it's like guys yeah you do stuff really well here's what what you do well fender uh you make cool guitars that's cool uh you make cool amps that's cool too uh, you make mm-hmm. some cool pedals, actually. Now they do. They the Fender pedals are actually really good. 
Um, I'm doing all right. You don't need nitrile rubber pick condoms for your your customer base. I'm just going to go back to this because there's one other thing I want to I want to talk about here. Okay. How the hell are you supposed to replace this pick when it goes bad? Do you just do you peel the the condom off and then it it almost looks like it has like there's like little no eh, no I don't know you probably just rip it out we'll post a picture yeah but then how do you get the new pick in do you I see what I'm saying uh, we're gonna have to buy some <laughs> and all try right it. I'm doing it I'm gonna I'm gonna go to guitar Center. actually they might not be out yet um I have some contacts at Fender <laughs> so if you're watching this you know Look, I, what are I, you doing? I'm, I'm so not, mad at you right now. Yeah, whatever, man. I'm not going to like hold an opinion back or a point of view back because I'm afraid of pissing off some company. Like it's no, fine. I, I, like I I think I get it. I'm going to ask I'm going to ask my guys at Fender like, "What come on. What are you doing?" And you know what? They probably don't even know about this. Like the the artist reps at Fender, they're probably just like, "What? Oh, you I don't do I don't deal with that stuff. I don't know who yeah. makes that stuff." Uh, other another non-gimmicky totally useful great um guitar pick here the uh chipson a shell oh. company <laughs> i saw the the huge pick <laughs> i couldn't tell what it was, I was like it's what on earth is that the chipson hand pick man um man. dude he he messaged me the other day there's a he's got a new product coming out that literally made me laugh so hard that i like started crying threw I'm, up <laughs> i'm gonna show it to you uh, but I'm not going to show the podcast. I'll show it to you afterwards. Okay, though. good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's a secret. <laughs> so yeah, the gimmicky thing, uh, it's, you know, there's plenty of that stuff out there and I think it is geared towards beginners. And I think that's why I don't like it very much is because it's going after a market because we all, we've all been there. I remember going to guitar center when I was first starting out and I was just so excited about guitar that I would just ask my mom to take me to guitar center so I could just like walk around and just see all the yeah. stuff. I didn't know what I was looking at or what I was doing. So a young, like 13 year old Rhett would have seen that. And was like, man, I've got five bucks to spend or 10 bucks to spend at guitar center. That's what I need. I'm going to buy that. It, right. Yeah. Don't, don't do that, man. And, and that's one of those things like losing your pick is one of those things that you, you just stop dropping your pick. Yeah. Like eventually even if you're using some really slick plectrum, you're going to learn how to hold on to it. Right. Because even now, like if I drop a pick, I get really mad at myself and I yeah. make sure that it doesn't happen again. So. Right. And if you're one of those people that like you play gigs and you drop picks all the time, dude, get the thing that sticks on your mic stand and holds like mm -hmm. 12 picks. There. there you go. Problem solved. That's a not gimmicky guitar gadget. Or you know what? Get a strip of gaff tape. Get a strip of gaff tape. Roll it up into a little doobie and stick it on the top of your guitar, like out of sight, and then just stick some picks to that. And there you go. Mm -hmm. Problem solved. You don't need pick condoms, Fender. And you look really cool. You look like Eddie Van Halen or something. <laughs> with picks stuck to your guitar. I'll tell you one guitar gimmick, or not, wait, one guitar gadget that's <laughs> not a gimmick that you got me is this. Um. Oh, shit. Okay. I think I know what you're going to show me. Right, here we go. Every guitar player should have one of these around. That's um, just a tool, like, regardless of guitar, that's a tool that exists. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, I know it from the uh, the perspective of a guitar player. You want to describe mm -hmm. what this is? So that's an ESP. Oh, wait, is that the ESP? No, is this is the mu music, music nomad. nomad. Hashtag not sponsored. Yeah, the, so uh, ESP were the first people to, like, make it popular, but it's called a spanner. And it's essentially a, um, it's two Vs. On a little metal stick, I, they can see it. Can, I'm holding it up. Yeah, that you can um, tighten or loosen a nut without having to have like you know a socket wrench or a driver or use a, a needle nose pliers. And what it does, it lets you lay it flat on a guitar to like tighten like a Les Paul you know switch or something, and you won't damage your guitar. And yeah. it works with almost any size nut, so it's super handy. Because if like something goes loose, you just you don't have to find the right size. It just fits. Yeah. So it's like I don't know what size or type of like nut that is, but let's say I wanted to yeah. tighten it on the switch, and it's got some felt on the back, so you don't screw up your finish, and you just you push it in there, and it grips, and you just twist it, and that's it. 
it's super handy. I've I've been using those for years just to tighten. I'll tighten a foot switch on a pedal with an actual like half inch like socket, yeah. and then to do the final tighten, I'll take one of those and give it one twist, and it just locks it in place. And yeah, they're like the ESP one's kind of expensive, it's like eight bucks or something. But right. it's the the Music Nomad. They're they're not as heavy duty as the ESP, but they work just as well, and they're like five dollars. You can get them on Amazon. Yep. Affiliate link below. I don't know. <laughs> Um, the other thing that I learned that's been awesome, and I learned this from Mason Marangella from Vertex uh, when when he built my pedal board a couple years ago. Go on Amazon and get a pack of car interior trim removal tools. These are a set of plastic, soft plastic tools. This is just one of them. They come in a pack, and there's all different shapes and sizes and stuff. These are amazing for like pedal boards and stuff, especially if you use dual lock on your pedal boards, which yeah. in my opinion, you should be using dual lock because it's the best um you can th- well if you're using dual lock you have to use these to get the get this the pedals off your board because it's so tough like yeah you can't just rip off the pedals on the board and because they're soft plastic they're not going to mar up your pedals or your board or your surface um and they come in all different and i've found so many uses for these outside of just my pedal board it's like oh man i gotta get in like <laughs> pry a knob off like this one for example is pretty good for getting under like a strat knob and just kind of popping it up break into a car yeah you can you can you can jimmy a lock um (laughs) kind of assault someone in an alleyway (laughs) yeah yeah that's uh don't do that um we're not we're not liable for for any of that kind of stuff no yeah we will link this stuff down below if anybody wants to see what it is eventually maybe not at first (laughs) whenever we get around to it it'll be it'll all be there i um I, I used to use dual lock on my like show boards, like for going to Nam. Yeah. And then when you have to, when you buy, when you, when you make a new pedal or like rearrange your board, the dual lock, when you do it, how you should do it, where you just put the dual lock only under the pedal. Yeah. And like, there's no other like Velcro anywhere else. Um, whenever you like change your configuration you have to rip it all off and it's a real bear so i I just went back to velcro but i'm not touring if you are touring there's different types of dual lock Mm -hmm. uh because there's some that's a lot punier and it's it's not as heavy duty but the stuff that like mason and like the guys at that pedal show use it you could you can hold one pedal and almost pick up your entire no you can like my board you can pick up your entire pedal board by one pedal uh itapestore.com is where you get it from again not sponsored no affiliation, but it's I, the letter I, tapestore.com. And they have all kinds of like crazy adhesive shit and Velcro and tape and all that kind of stuff. But um, I forget the actual model numbers. The The thing that Mason does, which is a pro move, is two different densities of dual lock. So you get, um, you get like a thinner density where the little lugs are more spaced out and you get a tighter density where they're much tighter together. And those, when they, when they interface and they lock together, it's like impossible to get off. I've almost broken on a bigger pedal, like a Strymon. You have to, you have to be careful how much dual lock you use, because if you use too much, you can't get the pedal off. Even with with these tools, I broke one of these tools one time trying to get a Strymon off of a board you'd um, have to get a metal crowbar to get it off probably yeah, probably and then you're gonna mar up your your pedal finish right. we're well, gonna relic your pedals uh um, hey hey man so yeah that's um i think we should link that stuff in the description box for people that are watching and if you're listening yeah. uh it'll be in the notes um the episode notes and uh maybe they will be affiliate links so if they are affiliate links that'll be a nice way for you guys to support the show um right moving forward yeah we're going to go. argue argue over who puts the affiliate links in the description. Uh, you can do it because you're editing <laughs> nah, all this I'm stuff. Do it. <laughs> <laughs> I need that $12 from Amazon. <laughs> right. I think the best thing, and one thing that I, I don't think as many people realize, maybe I shouldn't say, when you click an affiliate link, mm-hmm. uh, and I don't know if you've done this, you probably have. If, if someone buys anything yeah. after they visited Amazon from that link, it like saves that search history into your, your like. Well, it shows backend. you it shows you what they bought, but yeah, it doesn't show you who on, they are. So we should we should clarify right. like it doesn't have your name and then oh uh, right Jimmy Smith bought um, twelve rolls of toilet paper a bug zapper <laughs> and a, an external hard a huge, drive huge case of adult diapers. <laughs> it is funny but though. I, 
to see what people are like what you're earning a commission on. I do that sometimes on my yeah. main YouTube channel. And um yeah, I've it, it's crazy like people buy books. I've seen like the biggest ticket item somebody bought like um it was a guitar. You can buy it was like a Fender American Standard Strat or something that they bought with my link. Oh really? Which is super cool. Yeah. I I think most of the people that bought stuff from the the, the links that I have, they bought like dog food, mm-hmm. toothpaste, yep. and like that sort of thing. <laughs> yeah. so it's just funny. It's yep. just really funny to look at that. It is. <laughs> but again, to that. clarify, we can't see who you are and we don't right. know what you bought or where it's being shipped to or anything. It literally just says, this was, you sold six, like those spanner things, right? If there's an Amazon affiliate link for that, it'll be like, oh, you sold 25 of these. Uh, this was the overall sale price and this is your commission on it. That's how it yeah. works. Yeah, it's 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 all private, so go crazy. Yeah, let's get let's, let's get yeah. weird on Amazon. You can get really weird on Amazon. Go do it. I've seen some of the books that people have bought uh, before, like uh, online. You're like, oh Jesus Christ! <laughs> <laughs> somebody, it's it's astonishing to me one that somebody wrote a book on that, and then somebody bought it with my link. There's. Th- this is an episode in and of <laughs> we should just make a list or an episode going through our amazon lists seeing what people have bought <laughs> to clarify for me i make about a hundred dollars a year off amazon affiliate <laughs> yeah, links. i make no money it's not it's not very much money so don't don't no. think you're like you know we should yeah. we should start like a patreon style thing though we've got a few requests for that yeah and i, I i'm i'm down i mean I think we have to figure out a way to like provide um, incentive, like you know, for the higher tiers. And like, I could not see us being having like ten tiers of rewards. No. You know, just having like one or two. Right. So, right. And why don't we like put up our phone numbers and they can give us calls? Yeah, like, that'd be cool. Stuff. And I'll give um, I give my home address and your home address, and we can Perfect. you guys can just hang out, you know, and have yeah. <laughs> come by and have dinner. <laughs> Wear a mask. You can come by. Sit in the driveway. Uh, we want to thank the people that did email us. Um, we uh, yes. we set up the email. It's dipped in tone at gmail dot com. We got a few uh, a few submissions, so thank you. We're gonna mm-hmm. get some some reader mail going on. Shout out to Mario. Uh, he's saying he Mario. loves the uh, the channel. Just watch the podcast on YouTube. You're struggling to name a more iconic duo: bread and butter, <laughs> maybe. It's high praise. Um, oh, man. Let's see. Set up a Patreon so I can support this content. Well, we might just do that, Mario. Uh, Adam sent go. in. Uh, would love to see you tackle the. F- phase 90 gonna have to be a little bit more specific on that one adam i don't know what you mean do you want us to literally tackle a phase 90 (laughs) or do you want us to discuss the phase 90 i think it'd be really funny to like whenever the world gets back to normal if we can ever get together we should have like a literal viewer mail like response yeah episode yeah. And just we like set up a, a phase 90 and literally run into it. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing is because we're doing this on video, we can like set up and actually play and and like do playing stuff. Um so uh, they don't want to hear that, not from me. <laughs> yeah, they do. Zach's a good guitar player, everyone. Don't bling, bling, don't bling, listen bling, to his bling, uh bling, bling. his self-deprecating uh bullshit over here. Um <laughs> so here's the deal. Let's make that episode 3. Let's do that next week. That'll be a uh, a viewer mail episode. So um cuz we oh, already okay. got some we got some cool submissions here that we we don't have time to jump into here. But next episode, viewer mail. Uh back wait, no, that's my podcast. Back in stage. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh dipped in tone at gmail.com is the email. Send your suggestions in, your questions, your comments um what else can people send in oh one one suggestion somebody let me see if i can find this real quick um somebody wanted to post like have us judge their rigs yeah yeah was that pedro uh yes. yeah pedro alvarado that's a cool one too so we can we can offer some gear suggestions some tone tips uh some some rig um something that starts with r tone never mind <laughs> What? Like I just had a stroke. I was trying to come up with an alliteration for like tone tips, rig. Uh, we can't say rig rundown because that's rig. Premier guitar. Im- improve. Uh, <laughs> improve your rig. Oh, Regulate your rig. Ri- rig regulation. Rig regulation. That could be fun. That could be fun. 
uh, that doesn't mean you're great. in violation of our rig regulations. Yes. We'll, we'll, we'll create some standards and practices for, uh, for rigs right. and stuff. We'll, we'll be, it'll be the HR department of, um, of, of tone, of tone. <laughs> All right. We've digressed enough. That's uh, yeah. episode two, everyone. Thanks so much for hanging out. If you haven't done so already, be sub- sure to subscribe down below. Check out the links in the description box for, um, more information on what we talked about. I'll link this guitar.com article on these ridiculous Fender pick condoms that are. I'm going to get mad and start ranting again on that. So uh, that's all. I'm going to, I'm going to send you some, please. Actually, that would be funny. Um, so yeah, subscribe. We've already hit 500 subscribers on our first episode. So thank you guys for that. That's huge. Yeah. That is crazy. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah. And we will have this available in audio form very soon. Once I, get off my lazy ass and help Zach set it up. (laughs) All right. See you guys. (laughs) Bye.